So, good afternoon, everybody, and good evening. So, good afternoon here and good morning there in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. So, we are here once again with one more session uh, of Abralin Live. And today we have an interesting talk uh, about emoji as digital gesture, why internet linguistics matters. And today we have as our, our lecturers or our speakers, Professor Gretchen McLuck. I hope I have uh, pronounced your, you know, you know your name correctly. And Lauren Gunn. Both of them are, let's consider both of them as uh, internet linguists. And um, Professor Gretchen, let me just uh, make a brief introduction about these amazing, you know, linguists. Uh, Professor Gretchen McCulloch. Uh, Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's the I'm author not of... i professor is the thing that... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. She's, uh, okay, a researcher. <laughs> she's the author of, uh, she's uh, the author of the book Because Internet Understanding the New Rules of Language. And uh, she is uh, the co-creator of the Ling Enthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about uh, linguistics. Um, Professor Loringon, she's a linguist and she's also interested in this the relation between gesture and uh, speech and talk. And she is also a member of uh, the linguist, the linguistism. Um, so <clears throat> now uh, I'll give you I'll give you the, the, the floor to start your um, presentations. But also, let me tell you that uh, we have the, the participants. So whenever you are, you know, uh, presenting, I'm going to take some notes of the questions that people uh, might ask you. But I have a question for both of you. Which one do you prefer? Do you prefer to set out uh, a specific number of questions you want to answer or simply set out uh, a uh, an amount of time to answer the questions? Uh, I think do we have a if we have a time window, I think that's that's probably good. Okay, so you prefer so both of you present and then by the end we can start the okay. The yeah, I think questions. that's good. Okay, so Perfect. this uh, uh, first of all, Professor Gretchen. Oh or <laughs> I always make this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great. So I will just uh, share the slides. Um and thank you uh, to, uh, to Abraline for having us. It's uh, really an honor to get to uh, talk to a with a linguistic society that I uh, didn't know very well before uh, all of this happened. So it's, it's fun to sort of make this international collaboration happen. Uh, and I apologize for the, the difficulty of both my name and the podcast name in terms of how it really uh, illustrates the difficulty in adapting, uh, you know, phonotactics to a different language. So, um, with that, we're uh, really excited to talk about uh, Emoji as Digital Gesture, which is joint research between uh, me and Lauren Gon, uh, and sort of the, the origin story for how some uh, gesture linguistics ended up in, in Because Internet, which is some, uh, my book about internet linguistics, uh, and how we ended up doing uh, sort of this, this interesting collaboration. So I always like to start with a big question, uh, which you know, what is, what is language? How do we talk about language? And in the internet context, uh, this question of what is language uh, and how can we, you know, break down differences between, between different types of languages, what genres of language exist, it often gets answered in uh, this sort of dichotomy. Uh, so people often talk about, uh, you know, speech, conversation, um, you know, back and forth, informal, um, you know, real time vanishes as soon as it's said. Uh, and then they talk about writing, this static, uh, you know, less conversational, um, maybe characterized by books and newspapers and things like that, that doesn't vanish where you have a record. And, you know, this is a dichotomy that sort of ignores sign languages. And that's because it's a dichotomy that often ignores sign languages in the research as well. Um, the and it's often, it's often used to talk about languages like English, where, you know, you have 
uh, an extensive written tradition. Uh, so I think you would lump sign languages in with the, the spoken category, but most people who talk about this dichotomy don't talk about sign languages at all. So with that said, one of the early questions that you know, was of great interest to sort of the first generation of internet linguists was, is internet writing more like speech or more like writing? And the, you know, which, which part of this dichotomy does it fall under? And a lot of people made very interesting and persuasive cases for it being more like speech. But what I argue um, is that this dichotomy omits some things. And this dichotomy is not actually, it, it conflates some things. For one thing, it conflates this idea of spoken and informal with written and formal. And so what would happen if we broke out those categories? If we said, okay, uh, spoken and formal can be two axes, uh, or formality can be one axis and speech versus writing can be another axis. And what could we find in these other two spots if we made it into a grid? And the first thing we can find is formal speech. So formal speech is like what I'm doing right now. You know, I'm not having a conversation with you. There are people in the chat who are making comments, presumably, but I can't see them. And I won't get to see them until they get surfaced in the question period at the end. Please ask questions. We're very happy to answer them. Um, and also, I don't talk like this. You know, when I go at the pub talking with my friends, I don't engage in 40 minute monologues with a PowerPoint about particular to topics. For one thing, my friends would get very bored. <laughs> for two, they don't have very good uh, displays for PowerPoint in the pub back when we went to pubs. You know, I don't go home and talk to my dog like this. For one thing, I don't have a dog. And for two, I'm already at home. So this dichotomy between speech as informal and writing as formal, it omits, first of all, this very old genre of formal speech. We know that epic poems and things like oral histories were composed in formal genres. The ancient Greeks weren't wandering around like talking to each other in dactylic hexameter. They were, even though their poems were composed in it, because poems were a different genre. Um, and so this is a, this cline between formality and informality is able to exist even without writing existing at all. And that means that writing could potentially also exist at a climb between formality and informality. And I think that's exactly what we see online, where a lot of the writing that makes people very excited, you know, texting, uh, social media posts, uh, chat apps, things like that, this is informal writing. It's conversational, it's back and forth, it can disappear, it happens in real time, but it's still written. It's still very much of a written, medium. And one example of that is Key Smash. So Key Smash, you, you can't really speak it out loud. Well, okay, I can speak it out loud. Apparently, this is one of the things people really enjoy about the Because Internet audiobook is where I say things like and um, for which I credit entirely my linguistics training uh, at producing random strings of, uh, of phonemes. But that said, uh, most of the time, key smash is not characteristic of the spoken genre. It's not, even if some people can now say it out loud, it definitely starts with a keyboard and it's very letter based. And yet it's very clearly not formal. No one thinks of key smash as a formal genre. Um, so when we talk about the genres that uh, it, it, we talk about where internet writing is situated. I think we miss something if we try to characterize it primarily as speech. And we illuminate something if we try to characterize it as both writing and also informal. And so this is the corner of this chart that I'm particularly interested in. Although I think that expanding the range in general can also illuminate things about other genres like the sometimes neglected or left to rhetoricians genre of um, you know, giving, giving a formal talk. So, you know, here's the, here's the sort of breakdown of this chart that I've gradually built up, uh, which is, you know, this is, this is the corner that I'm interested in. And this is the corner that I think that um, studying the internet can also help us illuminate how this corner, because informal and writing isn't inherently internet-based. It doesn't have to be of the internet. 
Uh, and in fact, when we look at it as, okay, what other examples of informal writing do we have? We can also find things like postcards, uh, which, you know, I collected, I've been collecting postcards from thrift shops, <laughs> from used bookstores. They have old postcards. And a lot of the ways that people write on them looks a lot like Instagram captions. People seem to write, uh, you know, here's what I was doing. Here's where I was. Here was this fun, very stylized picture of a place where I was. And this is kind of a lot like how people write captions on, you know, image-based social networking sites, especially places like Instagram. Uh, or you have both people's notes to sell, you know, people's notes about their, uh, you know, in diaries and so on, which have doodles, people's notes um, in maybe a public health context where people have various types of drawings and doodles alongside uh, what they're actually writing. And this idea that writing letters and small pictures have to be divorced from each other, that's a very formal print-based idea. That's a sort of an artifact of the printing press, which made it a lot easier to type letters than to, you know, reproduce images. Um, even, you know, medieval manuscripts had images alongside text. So the idea that images can go alongside text has many precedents before the internet. And this is where we start talking uh, about emoji. So like any good dichotomy, uh, you know, informal versus formal is really a continuum. Um, we're going to keep talking about them as formal versus informal just because it's easier. But of course, there are gradations on this level. And there are axes of things other than formality, like the different types of groups that you're talking to in a particular context, if you're code switching, uh, if you're switching between languages. There are other things in the formal versus informal dichotomy. But this is why I think it's especially important to separate it out from writing versus speech because that's also yet another thing on top of that. So again, to return to one of these oft asked questions in internet linguistics, you know, the first observation is, oh, maybe it's kind of like speech. The second observation that, that happens all over the place for decades is there's no tone of voice or gesture in writing. Uh, and this somehow is more of a problem in internet mediated communication than it is in formal genres. Uh, you know, when you're writing an academic paper, there's also no tone of voice or gesture, but this seems to be less of a problem for you. And, uh, you know, indeed, in formal speech, people also gesture uh, a bit less or they gesture in a more stylized sort of way than when they're, you know, having a, an informal conversation, maybe doing a lot, a lot more gestures. My gestures have gotten very stylized. They're probably cut off by the video camera right now, but that's okay because we're sort of used to this talking head genre where you don't actually need to see the gestures in a formal space like this. And at the same time, there's this question of, okay, you know, emoji, you You've all, you've all heard of emoji. You, you saw emoji in the, in the title of this talk and you said, ah, that's the one I'm going to go to. Um, there's this question that we know as linguists where emoji very clearly don't have the characteristics of language. They can't accomplish the things that language can accomplish. If I were to try to give this talk entirely in emoji, I would be dead in the water before I'd even started. Um, there isn't even an emoji for emoji, whereas languages generally have names for themselves and can do you know, other types of things. And so this was a question that was very prominent in my mind to say, okay, how do we sort of solve this question, this perennial question of where do, uh, how do, how do you fit in this sort of gesture and tone of voice side in a way that's more concrete and instantiated than just saying, it seems like emoji somehow solved this problem. Okay, that's an observation a lot of people have made. What I was interested in, how can we make this observation more concrete? And secondly, how can we sort of replace this narrative, which is all too common in media, that emoji are somehow linguistic, which a narrative which falls apart as soon as you try to actually do anything with it. But many people who, who say that narrative don't try to do anything with it. How can we sort of create a different narrative for what emoji are actually accomplishing, which takes into account the actual data on how people are using emoji and how people are using language and is a very sort of data-driven approach to, you know, what, what's actually going on here with respect to communication. So this was a problem that was puzzling me while I was writing the emoji chapter of Because Internet. This would be around 2017. And I had, you know, sort of this list of, of emoji and gestures that seemed to correspond to each other. And I had this sort of, you know, the naive hypothesis that emoji somehow how correspond to, uh, to people's gestures, but I didn't have a, a concrete way to link the two. And this was when I uh, 
you know, <laughs> a certain point when you reach a certain level of frustration with a manuscript, uh, you give it to your collaborator to read. <laughs> uh, and, you know, Lauren had uh, had been a, a collaborator on the podcast, Lingthusiasm, uh, for for a while at this point. And I've been talking about the book with her and she said, look, just just let me read it and I'll <laughs> see if I can make any comments. Hey, hey look, uh, just let me read it and I'll see if I can make any comments. <laughs> uh, and so this is the point where I turned the presentation over to her. Uh, it was it was a delight to read, um, but I realized that we had been talking generally about, generally about. Um, the relationship between emoji and gesture, but I felt like there was something more systematic we could say about that. And so much like I'm intervening at this point in the talk, uh, I intervened at this point in Gretchen's thinking about um, how emoji might be accounted for um, in terms of their function with written speech. Um, so hi, I'm Lauren Gorn. I'm the other half of this paper um, and the other half of Lingthusiasm, which was how we started collaborating. So I need Gretchen to be my slide wrangler, unfortunately. The paper, the, the book has the, the chatty version of things, there's, uh, of this work. The, um, there's a podcast episode of Lingthusiasm, which has an even chattier version. But the um, article in Language at Internet is the source that has all the references. We've taken all of that out today. This is very much a general overview talk. Um, so for the literature and the more systemic element um, of this talk, um, check out the Gorn and McCulloch 2019 paper. With that in mind, we know that emoji have similar features to language, uh, to not to language, that's the opposite of what we want to say. Sorry, still early here. Emoji have similar features to gesture. And in the paper, we break down some of the systematic ways that emoji show similar structuring of meaning, um, use in interaction to gesture. There's a, a sustained literature in um, gesture studies, especially coming out of David McNeil's work um, that looks at the structural features of gesture in contrast to language. Um, and in the paper, we make an argument that emoji fall on the, the gesture side of things. But there's also an extensive literature within gesture studies, which categorizes different gestures based on both features of form and features of function. And there is ongoing discussion around what those categories are, we today are going to look at emoji in parallel to some of the more common gesture categories. Um, these again came out of the work of David McNeil and Adam Kendon um, and they're the most often used across the literature. So um, we think there's, there's value to be had in looking at um, other gesture categorization schema and how they might account for the function of emoji. But today we're just going to focus uh, on this categorization schema. Our first category are emblematic gestures, which you may also know as nameable or quotable gestures. These are always the easiest to talk about first because they are the most um, easily apparent to us in terms of the fact that they tend to have um, names. So we can see this dude with the cool haircut here giving a thumbs up. Um, they have stability of form. So a thumbs up requires you to extend your thumb in the upward orientation. If you extend it downwards, that obviously means the opposite of a thumbs up. Um, and if you were to extend any other finger, it would give a different meaning. So there's a, a um, standard of well-formedness um, to use the technical term, but it means that you have to do it right for it to have the right meaning um, for an emblematic gesture. Um, if we look at how we can use our emoji range, we actually see that emoji have sensibly taken the very convenient, easy to understand packaging of emblematic gestures and quite a few of those appear in the um, set of encoded emoji but also this idea that there's something that has a very easy name is um, also apparent beyond just the hand shapes. And one 
function that emblems can have is to clarify um, the intent of an interaction. So um, you can say, good job. And uh, with tone of voice, you have a lot of flexibility and with gesture um, in speaking, but in written form, that tone is conveyed by your choice of emoji. So that helps clarify the intent. That's our emblems. Our next category are iconic gestures. Um, these are used to depict something, whether that's um, physically, the literal, you know, the, the fish was this big, I made a cake that was this big um, kind of depicting gesture. Um, it can be metaphoric. We've collapsed metaphoric into the iconic category for this work, but there is a lot of very fascinating work on, um, you know, the her, her grades were improving. We're looking forward to coming uh, metaphoric uses of um, physical orientation. Uh, so there are kind of two parameters for that with um, gestures. There's a lot more flexibility in terms of hand shape and use compared to emblems. If we look at um, emoji use to illustrate, we see there are lots of depicting emoji that allow us to depict things and that we can attach those to messages and that addition to written text allows us to depict the topic. Um, you might always send cake, balloon, party popper when you send happy birthday. But even though you have that preference, um, it's still well formed to say happy birthday, whether you send it with those three emoji or no emoji or just a champagne bottle. So it has a similar flexibility that you don't have with uh, emblems where there's a really clear, meaningful uh, sense of you have to use this particular one because it has this particular meaning. Didactic gestures, if you've ever been in a gesture studies lecture with me, you know that I get very excited about how amazing it is that our brains can even process pointing at all, that we know not to look at the end of someone's finger, um, but to follow that imaginary line to whatever they are indicating towards. The human brain is so good at doing this that we do it in physical space with our hands and our eyes and our mouths. Um, and all kinds of um, parts of the body. And we also unsurprisingly have a range of pointing or didactic emoji um, that uh, we can use to orient the, the speaker towards information. Our next category are beat gestures. The others I've kind of talked about in terms of form, but also function. The form of beat gestures is really important. So it's that repetition. Um, and once you start noticing that something is a beat, you notice that um, people use these all over the place. Unfortunately, uh, Gretchen's hands were cut off during her part of the video, so you couldn't see, um, see her. But if you see uh, politicians always do this rep repetition, um, and that is used uh, in terms of beat gestures for emphasis. Um, and I should say you can have definitely um, someone pointing, uh, pointing and using the, the point towards, I, I want that one there. Um, and the repetition is adding that um, emphasis. So just to stress that these categories are not mutually exclusive, they can be combined. That repetition happens with gesture where you hold the same form, but you just repeat it. If we look at repetition in words, just to kind of, um, and this goes back to a, a smaller paper Gretchen and I wrote looking at um, repetition in gestures, words, and emoji. Repetition in words is really uncommon. Um, top, there, there are a small handful of low repetition um, Bigrams of English um, I had had, or it's very, very, very cold, but these are rare compared to repetition in emoji, which is the opposite of rare. This is some data that Gretchen worked on with um, SwiftKey uh, about five years ago now. And you can see this is the top 10 bigrams, trigrams, and quadrigrams. 
repetition is ubiquitous and it goes far below 10 when you get down into um, kind of the top 100 it's still lots of repetition or it's um, very close repetition it's either um, you know you can see 10 in the bigrams there we have heart eyes and kiss they're still very closely thematically related so um, repetition in emoji is ubiquitous and you'll see beats all over gesture when you start tuning into it and our argument is that in much the same way that repetition for beat gestures has an emphatic uh, quality, repetition in emoji also has an uh, emphatic quality and we've turned those gifts into tweets for you. We have not discussed a couple of categories um, or functions of gesture uh, that we go into in more detail in the paper. We just wanted to kind of give you the the, the big four categories of gesture and some parallels that we see with emoji. Um, we also know, of course, that this is um, an equivalence that is not, uh, you, you can't take it all the way because um, gestures can occur at the same time as speech. Um, so I can make a hand shape at exactly the same time I'm saying the word, but because emoji are strings that are included with text, um, they, they occur near each other instead of perfectly simultaneously. Um, but we think that there is, a, an, it has allowed us to have insights into how people use emoji uh, that we think are worth exploring further. And so we have some future directions that we'd like to see uh, the study of emoji go in. Um, first, we still need to map out future uses of emoji and particularly think about, if we, if we think about emoji as gesture, then we can start thinking about what emoji we should be including in the set of emoji because it's a, it's a long process, it's a slow process for um, the formalized uni set, uh, Unicode set of emoji. Um, so we can use this research, and in fact, Gretchen and I have used this research. Um, the raised pinky finger is now um, a submitted proposal to Unicode that we wrote um, with our colleague Jennifer Daniels because it's um, an emblematic gesture that has a variety of functions. Um, you can add what you think the raised little finger means uh, to the YouTube comment section if you like. Um, but you might find that there's some variation across cultures as to what that gesture means. So we're relying on the flexibility um, of the emblematic gesture here um, deliberately to make it as multifunctional as possible. So that's one future. The other is that, of course, um, for me in particular, this slide, is that we... Um, I can return to thinking about gesture in a way that's more deeply informed by what's happening online. And one thing that is immediately apparent to me is that we are still uh, under-described in terms of the emblem categories and the emblem gestures that exist across the world's languages. We still have a very Eurocentric point of view um, that's a problem for gesture studies. That's a problem for future encoding of emoji. Um, and I'd like to see that rectified. And of course, um, emoji aren't the only thing people are doing online um, in terms of kind of returning multimodal experiences, returning um, kind of gesture and those kinds of interactional functions to writing. Um, we think there's an opportunity to look at other online communicative tools. We would love to see people doing more and thoughtful work um, on GIFs, um, on stickers, uh, with the flexibility that they have in comparison to emoji, um, into online chat interfaces. We think there's um, a really rich world of interactional uh, exploration that can be done online. Uh, and with that in mind, I hand back to the person who uh, has a better idea of what's happening across those. Yeah, and I think one of the things that is, you know, interesting and exciting about looking at uh, both gestures and stylized faces is that 
is the way they can illuminate, you know, cross-cultural misunderstandings that show up in the emoji space sometimes. So um, if we go back to, uh, you know, old school text-based emoticons for a minute, there's an interesting dichotomy where, uh, so on the the, the, the white hand side of my screen, I don't want to say left and right because who knows what's being flipped around right now. Uh, but on the, on the white panel, we can see uh, a kind of classic Western old school emoticons with a colon parenthesis uh, in, in either direction. And these can have the same eyes uh, and they rely for their emotional disambiguation on the shape of the mouth. And on the green hand side of the screen, uh, we can see uh, Japanese style kamoji, uh, which are also, you know, both emoticons and kamoji date back to the 1980s um, because they're from this, you know, this environment where you don't have a lot of options for pictures. And so you're making them out of uh, text-based characters. And the kamoji here, they also represent different emotions. They represent respectively happy and sad. And they have the mouths the same, or the mouths can be the same in this style. And the eyes are what's different. And that's what conveys these two different emotions. You have the smiling eyes and the eyes with the big tears falling from them with the, with the tea. And What's interesting about this is when it comes to designing emoticon, or when it comes to designing emoji rather, um, you can sometimes get difficulties like the formerly Apple had a few years ago, uh, where you can have a shape like the one in the center, and that's got smiling eyes, but it's got a sort of grimace shaped mouth. mouth. So people can interpret that differently depending on their familiarity with Western style cartoons or with uh, anime style uh, or ma and manga style uh, Japanese face expressions. And so this is the kind of thing that when it comes to designing emoji, when it comes to figuring out what we're trying to implement, if we think about emoji within this broader context of other types of stylized faces, other ways of representing emotions or representing communicating things in a stylized manner, we can get more clarity about exactly what we're trying to represent and what we're trying to do with the particular art. Um, Whereas if we think about emoji as something that's somehow universal, then we're faced with this question of, well, if it's universal, then how is it that so many people were misinterpreting this particular emoji? Um, and that's because neither gestures nor uh, emoji are truly universal. There are some aspects that seem to be found in a lot of cultures, you know, laughing seems to be pretty common, uh, but lots of things are stylized and they're found differently in different cultures. And they may not exactly correspond to linguistic borders, um, you know, things like the thumbs up is found around Europe, but they do, uh, they, they are found in, in cultural sorts of contexts. You know, we need to teach young children how to do something like waving. They're not born knowing this. So thinking about these in terms of a broader cultural context can bring more understanding to what, uh, how things can be designed and what should be created. And secondly, I think that looking at uh, emoji in this sort of data-driven way in, you know, the, the same kind of data that people bring to the study of gesture helps us move away from analyses of emoji that rely too heavily on what I call stunt emoji use. The idea that like, here's what emoji could do um, and instead focus more on what people are actually doing right now. Uh, and so I'm picking on Mark Davis here because he was <laughs> until very recently the chair of the Unicode uh, Emoji Subcommittee, so I feel like he can take it. <laughs> I don't normally screen cap individual people to, to pick on them, but you know, Mark is, Mark is special. Um, so uh, there, this question of do people ever use something like the scale emoji in the mouse or the scale emoji in the elephant for light or heavy, that's an interesting proposal, right? Like someone could do it. But I think this is a problem that we see with analyses of internet language in general, where it's it's very easy to sort of impose your ideas of what someone could be doing or what the platform potentially affords without making effort to look at the specific details of what people are doing, um, what people are actually doing. Uh, and when we think about, okay, what does it look like? What are emoji gonna look like in 30 years? What, how should we be changing emoji in the next 30 years? Uh, what, are people, what are people going to be doing with them 30 years from now? We can look back to the 1980s to see what people were doing with emoticons at the time, and it hasn't changed all that much. You know, there were a bunch of fanciful text-based emoticons at the time, you know, things like Santa Claus and Abraham Lincoln and like the Rose, made out of ASCII-based characters, but the ones that have really stuck around have been these faces. And I think for emoji, it's going to be fairly similar that we need to look at what people are actually doing. 
And so I'm really excited about the uh, new data that uh, Unicode, the Unicode Consortium has, has released, which I wrote up in an article for Wired uh, late last year, which talks about how popular each category of emoji actually are. And we see that some of the categories that Unicode has been putting a lot of effort into adding new items in, so things like objects and symbols and even animals, uh, actually rank fairly low when it comes to popularity. And categories uh, that they haven't necessarily been adding as much to, things like hearts, uh, things like flowers are really oddly popular, um, but maybe not so oddly because flowers are always been used for the symbolic function, right? You know, the rose has a symbolic meaning in addition to uh, its literal meaning as a, as a flower. So looking at the actual levels of popularity of, of individual emoji and looking at things in sort of a, a, a data-driven way lets us, lets us find directions for how you know, what we should be doing in the future, what, what kinds of things would, would be popular if people started using them. Uh, whereas previously, you know, Unicode had been trying to find you know, some sort of objective criteria for coming up with, with which emoji should be popular. You know, they don't want to add 32 dinosaurs, even though that would be awesome, because then you'd have to add 32 of fish and 32, uh, you know, every single other uh, variant on, you know, 32 different flavors of pizza and so on. And at a certain point, that gets to be really unwieldy. Um, so, you know, it's, it's useful that Unicode had been trying to come up with criteria for this, but unfortunately their criteria had been uh, very, very linguistic and not very gestural. And so they hadn't taken into account how emoji are actually used. Uh, so this is things like looking at how popular a word is in Google search results or in Google trends. But unfortunately, while people often search for things like coats and pretzels because maybe they want to buy a coat or buy a pretzel or make pretzels or something like this, these emoji as objects score below median uh, when it comes to actual usage. And things like, you know, face with tears of joy or sparkle heart or something, which are very popular as emoticons, aren't the type of thing that people search for that much. So there's this sort of tension between, you know, what is a, what is a criteria for popularity? Uh, and we think that if we look at gesture and we, you know, assuming that we can come up with a, a more accurate typology of which gestures are popular cross-culturally, which is still, you know, uh, something that we've now realized is a work in progress, but if we come up with a more accurate characterization of which gestures are popular, that potentially points to a way to create emoji that are also popular for general usage and are useful in conversation. You know, whenever a new face emoji gets added, it's very popular pretty much immediately. I think pleading face is the new, the new, the newest face emoji, and it's it's already very popular. So thinking about emoji in terms of what people are actually doing with them instead of what people could be doing with them but aren't necessarily is something that we're able to do now that we have so many years of data on what people are actually doing with emoji. And this brings us to uh, sort of a broader point of clarification uh, that, you know, there are two points that I want to want to leave you with in this talk. And one of them is that like all areas of linguistics, internet linguistics needs to be driven by data and needs to be driven by actual usage. So it's not enough to say, okay, here's what people could potentially be doing with emoji. Here's what people could potentially be doing with, you know, any other area of internet linguistics, which I haven't gotten into here, whether it's acronyms or punctuation or, uh, you know, GIFs or, or anything like this. There's an interesting point to be made that platforms have different sorts of potentials. But when it comes to actually looking at what's going on when it comes to actually sourcing data, uh, we need to be very transparent about wh what sources of data things are coming from. If people are getting uh, data from joke websites where people try to you know, retell uh, fairy tales using emoji, that's interesting, but it's an analysis only of that specific jo joke genre. It's not an analysis of emoji in general. So we need to figure think about how this uh, analysis is happening with respect to data. And there are a lot of, you know, especially uh, more junior scholars and scholars who've been analyzing internet linguistics for a long time, people who are very deeply embedded in internet communities who do have this dedication to data. But it's something to keep in mind if you're considering venturing into this area that like any other field, you can't make assumptions about how, uh, the, how things are done or how things are are put together, what, what kind of communication is happening without a lot of attention to the specific context of what people are actually doing uh, from a data perspective. And secondly, the inverse point where studying internet language can help us think 
uh, more interestingly about language in general. And from the very specific example, which, you know, I hadn't been exposed to gesture studies when I was in grad school because, you know, not all not all subfields get taught uh, in all in all places. Uh, and so it was exciting for me, you know, that feeling when you first get exposed to linguistics, and you're like, wow, here are all these hidden patterns that that can show up that I never realized uh, that I didn't I didn't realize was going on. And you start, you know, eavesdropping on people in public uh, and trying to think, you know, what what are people doing? And so being able to have that experience again, you know, long after I thought I, I knew what all the subfields were uh, and have that experience of like, oh, now I get to eavesdrop on people's gestures as well. And it has become entirely impossible for me to carry on a normal conversation, uh, which I think is extremely relatable uh, which so that's kind of sort of one specific example but I think also to go back to the point at the beginning where we talk about what happens when we you know if we if we're using internet language to say okay there's this tension between things people have been assuming about speech uh, and versus assuming about writing and what actually needs to take place is to divorce the conception that speech and writing uh, inherently have informal or formal characteristics and you can actually have uh, many varieties of both. So when we think about uh, internet language as a place where it becomes really obvious to us that this sort of pluricentricity is the norm, that um, there are lots of different ways of communicating with each other, whether it's um, and people writing down languages that hadn't necessarily been historically written down because they want to text uh, with their friends and family in, you know, version varieties that hadn't had a formal written tradition up until this point, but they're going to figure out some way of doing that because they want to be able to communicate with people in their language. Uh, or whether that's, you know, something like, okay, what's the communicative function of emoji? It, internet language makes the, the informal written genre suddenly a lot more visible than when it was in more private and less uh, pub uh, less published uh, varieties like letters and postcards and stuff, which often don't make uh, the news or go viral in the same way that a tweet can go viral or that a screen cap of a text message can you know end up uh, end up in the news. So internet language can uh, illustrate things that have been true for a long time about language and just sort of provide that additional context that lets us figure out what's going on in informal writing, and then sometimes reflect that back to things that we didn't already know uh, about other varieties of language as well. Uh, and with that, uh, we have a references section. If you want to see the references from, from this talk, you can check uh, either uh, my book or the, the paper that we wrote. And we're now very happy to take questions. I think I'm going to move out of slide share mode so that I can see the I guess I can keep this on present. Very nice. So, well, 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 we have some interesting questions here. Um, so, I was trying to to classify them, to to categorize them according to your presentation order. Um, let me get check here. So, I believe that this this first one. Is, to, is addressed to Gretchen. Well, check here. Okay, so it's a question by Hen, and uh, this person asks, is key smash regularized, formalized by keyboard layout though? Yeah, so key smash is definitely uh, influenced by keyboard layout. Uh, there's, there's a couple things. <laughs> <laughs> interesting things to know about key smash. Um, so the the at the moment we have what I what I think of as kind of old school key smash or desktop based key smash and phone based key smash. Um, so the the key smash that tends to begin ASDF uh, or some letters like that tends to be produced from a desktop keyboard, whereas key smash that contains like a lot of G H J K. Uh, you know, B, B, N letters from the center of the keyboard tends to be produced on a, on a phone keyboard. Because if you think about how you hold a phone, you know, with your thumbs, you're kind of mashing on the middle versus if you hold a, a, a smartphone keyboard, you're kind of mashing on the home row there. Uh, and when I did, I did a very brief and not particularly scientific survey of how people write key smash. Uh, and I heard from several people who use the Dvorak keyboard, um, which in case anyone isn't familiar, it has a completely different layout and it puts the vowels on the home row with the idea that they should be the easiest ones to type because they're the most frequent in, in most languages. Uh, and so people who use the Dvorak keyboard reported that they had also stopped key smashing 
or had to start key smashing very, very carefully because if they just mashed on the home row, they'd produce this sort of string of vowels that was completely socially legible to anyone who was interacting with them. Like, why are you screaming? Uh, it didn't register as key smashed at all the people. So uh, there was that aspect of it. And then also some significant portion of people reported that uh, if the key smash turned out in a way that didn't quite look like other people's key smash, they would delete it and re-key smash or they'd adjust a few letters to try to produce something that was socially legible. So it has tendencies. It's obviously not the exact same key smash every single time, but there are definitely certain tendencies around how people tend to key smash. Interesting. <laughs> Even for me, it's really, it's a new, you know, uh, research field, international linguistics. I don't know if anyone has done the like cross-linguistic key smash things, you know, like the French keyboard that has a zerty instead of QWERTY. Does that mean that because their A is in the top row rather than the home row, they produce some sort of different cross-linguistic key smash? If anybody wants to do, you know, a proper corpus study of cross-linguistic trends in key smashing, uh, please tell me, I'd love to cite you. <laughs> It's really interesting because we have like two or three questions concerning cross-cultural, you know, uh, research on, you know, emojis and stuff. Well, uh, maybe I believe this is one uh, to Lauren. Has much research been done comparing emoji used in different languages in the same way that gestures can hold different meanings in different cultures? It was a question by Miss Hanak. And there is a second question, you know, in the same in the same track. Is there evidence of different emoji use in different internet subcultures depending on what the platform allows by hand? I will answer those uh, in the order. Uh, but I mean, they, they both relate to a very similar thing, which is that there is some cross-linguistic variation in emoji use. Um, there are some that, because the original set were um, originally set up in Japan, there are quite a few, especially early on, where the Japanese use was um, specifically tied to their representation and then English speakers reimagined them. So um, the, the bank building was just kind of used um, as a, a general office building um, among English speakers. Um, you see different frequencies in some emoji across cultures. So um, I, I don't remember the exact data, but I think you see more use of like roses in South America than you do in North America um, as a sign of affection where you um, are more likely to just see hearts in North America. So there's definitely variation in use but I think it is understudied still I think Herring and Gare um, have a paper on the use of emoji and stickers and a whole variety of um, interactional tools across um, Chinese and looking at that in compared to English um, and that's probably one of the more systematic and insightful studies that have been done but there is lots of work that can be done. And then to the second question from Hen, within subcultures, within particular languages, definitely lots of um, variation. And I would say, as with any linguistic phenomenon, um, you get idiosyncratic uses among small groups. So um, uh, it's unsurprising that we see that, but also understudied in a systematic way. Just to add a couple more examples to that. <laughs> yeah, One, please do. There's a lot of uh, cultural interpretation around is the folded hands uh, emoji, which I'm which I'm demonstrating right now in front of my <laughs> face. Uh, and this was originally encoded in the Japanese emoji set to indicate thank you, which is sort of a thank you bow. Um, there's also a full person that, that performs that that action, um, but it's gotten repurposed in Western contexts to mean in some, for some people high five, uh, although less so increasingly. And I think for more people. Uh, blessed or prayer hands um, is where it's it's more used there. But and then there are some there are some uh, Western speakers who still use it for thank you if they're particularly if they're more familiar with Japanese culture um, or they use the full body one for thank you. But that one, you know, and it's it's the case that you know you know hands with palms pressed up against each other just has different interpretations in different cultures. Um, another example of you know different subcultural use of emoji uh, is especially with the colored hearts. Uh, in, you know, a lot of different subcultures have specific meanings that they attach to particular colors of hearts. 
Uh, so Instagram uh, did a study about this with hash, they looked at which hashtags uh, correlated with which particular emoji. Uh, and they found that a lot of the hearts were used for things like particular sports teams. You know, if you use the blue heart because your sports team is blue or because your university is blue or because you're, you know, you're talking about something where blue is a relevant feature there uh, or use the green heart, you know, because you're talking about something where, uh, where green is a relevant feature. So people use, people have the hearts take on a lot of additional uh, sorts of meanings. And I think especially on platforms where you can upload custom emoji. Uh, so places like Discord and Slack, uh, where you can add your own images that are then treated as emoji within that particular space. Uh, people often upload additional hearts and additional colors, uh, especially with things like pride flags, uh, all of the different rainbow flags. Uh, people upload those to indicate you know, both a particular identity and a particular, and a heart within that. So those, those are the kinds of things that, that people use individual custom emojis for in particular subcultures. Interesting. Since you mentioned something about the colors and, and stuff like blue, uh, there is a question from Luana de Conto. And she said, I was wondering if color can code something. For example, a black heart can be associated or not to mourning, but, uh, but green heart, blue heart, are these associated with some intended content? Also, emoji have incorporated a different skin color for human figures, and that can be used to assert different ideologies, sort of, uh, sort of a social statement from the speaker. In that sense, could emoji be a tool for communication also in the discourse level? Yeah, I think so. We've talked about hearts a little bit uh, already and how different colors are used for different things. With respect to skin tone, so Emojipedia had a really interesting blog post looking at data around the use of the raised fist emoji uh, around uh, Black Lives Matter tweets. Uh, and what they found was that the darkest skin tone and the second darkest skin tone were primarily associated with, we, 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 of the raised fist emoji, were primarily associated with Black Lives Matter tweets and they used several different hashtags to compare them. And that the, uh, you know, paler skin tones and the non-skin tone version of the raised fist emoji were not as associated. It was the specific function that people had of the skin tone as well as the raised fist that conveyed that particular thing in that context. It wasn't so much like, oh, you can just use the raised fist generically for that uh, topic. So I think that uh, the, the different skin tones can add on this additional perspective either of, you know, this is me as a person who's saying it. So people use the, the skin tones to make, make the emoji more themselves or to be, this is the this is the people that I'm talking to, or this is this is the context in which I'm saying this. Obviously, the raised the raised fist uh, has um, has connotations of the Black Power movement and these kinds of things. So there's there's additional connotations that that particular emblem has in that particular context where it's used with a particular skin tone, and all of these things can come together. Uh, for other types of colors, I'd really love to see, and this is you know my my pipe dream <laughs> for for emoji editions. But I think it would be really interesting to see. Uh, ever since I did the look at which emoji are popular from Unicode's perspective, uh, and noticed that flowers were doing really well, they're kind of punching above their weight um, compared to you know we've been adding a lot of animals uh, because you know animals have sorts of obvious functions. You know if you add like a T Rex dinosaur, uh, that has a certain symbolic meaning that the herbivore dinosaur doesn't have, um, but flowers are also used for the symbolic meaning. And especially I think the fact that we only have one rose, it's a red rose. Um, whereas particularly roses in different colors, you know, a yellow rose or a white rose or a black rose, these mean different things to people. And I think people would use a yellow rose or a black rose or a white rose in contexts that are different from how they're currently using a red rose. So I think thinking about flowers in terms of their symbolic value, you know, on the one hand, uh, I've definitely I've definitely heard people at Unicode make this argument, well, like, we already have so many flowers, why do we need more? But you could also say this, that we already have so many animals, why do we need more? It's because both animals and flowers can be used for this sort of symbolic function as well. Uh, and so thinking about not just which things, you know, which things exist as objects, but also which things, which objects are used symbolically or which, which objects are used as emblems can sort of give us some pointers to where it makes sense to expand uh, emoji use. Cool. Uh, another question, this time to Lauren. Uh, Lauren, this is a question from Adam, our 30th, uh, 37. <laughs> Since intonation and gesture are so tightly linked in language, to what extent do emojis, as opposed to punctuation maybe, serve an, uh, 
intonational purpose? Um, thank you, Adam. You're right that um, intonation is also a factor in spoken language that we lose in um, written language. And um, punctuation normally does a lot of that work in writing. Um, there is some work that has looked at um, the kind of illocutionary function of emoji and how that ties to um, kind of tone of voice strategies that we have for spoken language. And um, that, I, I think that is also a useful uh, contribution. We're not saying that emoji are gesture and gesture only. Um, we're not arguing such a strong version of that. So I think um, emoji are definitely with those um, emblematic gestures where they're conveying the um, elocutionary force or the, the meaning behind um, good job um, as the example that we had. It's the emoji there that's kind of conveying the, the tone and therefore the intonation on that utterance. I don't know, Gretchen, if you have more yeah, to say have... on that. I'm, I'm just <laughs> obviously handing back to you. <laughs> I have many thoughts on this. Uh, I think that uh, it's useful to think about, you know, there's there is a there's a big there's a broad claim that that emoji that 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 you know emoji and punctuation can do some of the stuff that gesture and tone of voice has done. And when I in because internet when I try when I looked at okay if if we can make this broad claim then we should be able to make more specific claims, which is that particular emoji correspond to particular types of of gestures or intonations or that particular punctuation marks in particular context should correspond to specific ones. And over and over again, what I often found was that punctuation, it was easy to find a, uh, a sort of acoustic correlate, an intonational correlate, and emoji, it was easier to find a gestural correlate. So it's possible that there are some examples in the other direction. I haven't found very many. Uh, I'm interested if anyone has specific uh, examples there. The broader claim I think though is more interesting, which is that we have often talked about uh, emoji, or we've often talked about gesture and tone of voice uh, in terms of their physical correlates, which is, you know, here are these sorts of things that you can do and implicitly they convey some sort of meaning. And that meaning is so obvious, we don't need to actually say what we mean when we say tone of voice. We don't need to say what we mean when we say gesture. And I think making those meanings more specific and concrete is part of the broader, um, the broader project of linguistics. And uh, when we say, you know, there's nothing about language that is so obvious it needs to go without saying, we need to really dig in and explain every single joke and why it works. Uh, and I think that talking about emoji and punctuation and other types of uh, visual uh, attributes, you know, gifts and so on, and trying to really instantiate those claims very concretely helps us point towards a bigger project, which is what are the ways that we convey certain types of um, paralinguistic meaning or pragmatic meanings or elocutionary force or all of these sorts of additional layers of meanings that people have on top of here's the literal content uh, of the actual words that I'm saying. And some of this stuff has been going on for a long time with things like Gricean maxims uh, and some of this stuff and, and elocutionary force and some of this is newer and sort of thinking about what are the exact physical correlates, whether that's uh, tone of voice or whether that's gesture or whether that's things like uh, non-manual signs in the signing space, whether that's things like emoji or emoticons, what are the, you know, we can sort of separate out uh, the physical correlates of this broader thing, which is this additional level of pragmatic meaning. And we can do that more easily if we examine things across different modalities. So we don't get caught up in the idea that it's so obvious that there's no explanation to be done. Interesting. Um, there is another question from Kendra Swafford. Um, I don't want to answer, I believe. Can you speak to the use of emojis to convince sarcasm? Uh, Gretchen, it's a sarcasm <laughs> question. I'm going to hand over to you. So I think like uh, looking at the gesture literature was very illuminating when I was looking at emoji. Uh, looking at the irony literature has also been very illuminating when I was uh, writing the, the section in Because Internet about ironic uh, punctuation in particular, but emoji use can also be done there. And what I think is important to note about irony in general is that irony always involves a risk. There is no irony without risk and there is no irony without ambiguity and potential for misinterpretation. Because if we wanted to speak in a way that allowed for no potential miscommunication, we already have a tool for that and it's called not being sarcastic. So 
the at the point at which <laughs> we've chosen a you know irony we've decided to venture into irony it's because at some level we want to allow for the potential of miscommunication and then when it doesn't happen it's very exciting and it 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 reinforces trust between the speakers uh, because you know you had you had the ability to to misinterpret me and yet you didn't which shows that you truly understand me which shows that we we really understand each other and we're on the same page and so with that said, um, there's about five centuries of proposals for a sarcastic punctuation mark or for an ironic punctuation mark, um, dating back to uh, you know 1575 is the first one that I've uh, been able to find. Possibly there are older, I don't know. Um, and every every century thereafter, sometimes more than once a century, you get various philosophers and and people, uh, intellectuals saying, "What about this for a sarcastic punctuation mark? We clearly need a sarcastic punctuation mark." And what I think is important to recognize is those proposals don't get adopted. And then finally, what succeeds are things that are not a new punctuation mark, but things that are outgrowths of existing uses of punctuation symbols and emoji. Um, and these are, some of them predate the internet, things like scare quotes. You know, this is using an ironic signifier of authority to indicate a false authority. And you have to know that these quotations can't possibly be quoting something real in order to interpret them as scare quotes or things like using capital letters to indicate that something is very important. You know, that that sort of, you know, whether that's the tone or whether that's the, the gesture that I instinctively do when I talk about things being very important uh, or whether that's the, the punctuation, the, the capitalization itself, those, it's an ironic use of that when otherwise a capital letter can be used as a signal of authority. Um, and then similarly in the internet context, things that are often used, things that are used as symbols of enthusiasm uh, can in a certain context also be interpreted as ironic. So sparkles, especially whether that's sparkle punctuation like the tilde plus asterisk or just the tilde or sparkle emoji, um, but other types, any something that can be interpreted as enthusiasm in a context where the person who's, who's typing is act very clearly not actually enthusiastic becomes a signifier of ironic enthusiasm. And I think it's that multi-step process where something could be misinterpreted and yet you have sufficient context to know that it's actually being ironic is what makes internet irony succeed uh, in a punctuation sort of way where other types of top-down irony punctuation proposals had failed because they tried to propose just one punctuation mark that would always indicate irony. But that's just not how irony works. Irony has to allow for that possibility of ambiguity and for that possibility of interpretation because otherwise you might as well just be being completely lucid and that would kind of destroy the fun of it. Cool. Interesting again. <laughs> it's a really interesting topic. I was like, you know, thinking about this relation between, you know, uh, irony and emojis and tone of voice, prosody, this kind. Well, we have another question uh, from Jack Beckenpath, I think this is the pronunciation of his name. So are there any differences in tone structure of emojis cross-culturally, like in the way that emojis are used to convey tone tone in different cultures? Uh, thanks, Jack. I am sure there are, and I can't think of any off the top of my head. Gretchen, do you have any I, I mean, it's the kind of thing that it's a great empirical question. I'd love to see someone do that study, which I know is a really, uh, <laughs> it's a really unsatisfying answer because it's exactly the kind of question that I would really love to see someone study in more depth, um, particularly uh, in the context of, you know, we know that people use emoji to influence the way in which the neighboring words are interpreted, but to in a lot of the uh, data driven studies of emoji at scale look at just specifically which emoji are being used. And we do have evidence that which emoji is chosen differs cross culturally. And we do have evidence that certain emoji uh, are interpreted differently cross culturally, which we've already talked about in this Q&A. Um, but this question of, you know, are emoji adding a different pragmatic interpretation to the words that they you know, uh, accompany, does that differ cross-culturally? Probably. Uh, but yeah, I would love to see someone do that study. Interesting. So you, you just answered the last question. It was uh, from Weizmann, and he asked, uh, are you interested in studying emojis from contrastive or cross-linguistic views? If yes, is there any possible way of collaboration? I mean, send us an email. <laughs> the I think I think that 
uh, one of the things that we were hoping to do with uh, this paper and this, you know, looking at emoji as gesture is sort of open up a new domain of questions because I think that the uh, the study of emoji had gotten very bemired in this sort of noun based approach of like, oh, well, we have an emoji for this noun, we have an emoji for that noun. But it turns out people aren't really using emoji just as nouns. They're using them for all of this. And that would actually be kind of linguistically more boring. You know, if they're using the cat emoji to stand for a cat, did you feed the cat? Great. What does that really tell us? I don't know. Um, but if you, they're using emoji as sort of pragmatic indicators. And I think this, I think of this, you know, sometimes, um, you know, syntacticians who are studying particular languages, we get really excited by like, here's a language that actually has, you know, a morpheme that does this sort of abstract thing that I had been proposing was possible. And now we found a language that has this morpheme that actually, you know, here's this particle or here's this suffix that like does this thing that I thought that some languages might have. And I think it's, it's can be very similar for a pragmatic indicator because of course it can be easier to study emojis as a as a closed set than it can be to study things like gesture where there's, you know, more, potential for people disagreeing about whether, you know, how exactly was this hand formed in this particular say, there's more potential for, for nuance there, which is, of course, what makes it exciting and easy, easier to communicate with, maybe, but it may be easier to approach that study uh, via emoji, where you have something that can be more pinned down, you say, I know someone used the thumbs up here, uh, and so I can study how they're using the thumbs up or some other emoji uh, as a sort of first stab at that. And then I'd want to see, okay, what happens if you try to, to look at, you know, how people are, are speaking there. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it has the potential to be to be really interesting. And we're hoping that uh, this is a sort of springboard for people coming up with all sorts of really interesting ideas for for what to do with it later. Yeah, I know it's um, I know there's a reputation for researchers wanting to be really involved in the development of a field. But actually, I want to see a whole bunch of papers that I had nothing to do with. <laughs> um, I want to see more students encouraged to publish the amazing data they collect and analyze in, um, you know, senior year courses uh, on communication online. Um, I want to see their professors support them to publish that work publicly because I think there is lots of amazing thinking happening and there's so much uh, open sky. Is that? No, green fields. Is that the metaphor that we use? Green fields are... Uh, <laughs> in internet linguistics and there's um there's no one better to be looking at that than the people who live and talk in those environments yeah and especially when you're looking at a detailed understanding of the pragmatic context in which a particular statement is to be understood it's much harder to come in as an outsider to a particular community you know even though i spend a lot of time online <laughs> i'm not in every online community <laughs> uh and say, oh, this is definitely the pragmatic interpretation that somebody had here. It really requires this sort of detailed level knowledge of what's going on in a particular community, how people are using a particular emoji, and to say, uh, you know, encourage, you know, more junior scholars to be writing writing up versions of this that, uh, that people can cite uh, and, you know, figure out what's going on in a lot of different particular communities with uh, the sort of pragmatic effects of emoji. Cool. Well, ladies, so these are the questions I have, you know, taking the notes. So do you have any other final remarks to make or something to, to say? Yeah, well, thank you everyone for coming. And it's, uh, I assume that we'll, we'll leave this and see uh, a lot of tweets and so on uh, directed at us. Uh, if you're looking for the slides for this talk, they're at bit.ly slash Abrilene uh, hyphen mm -hmm. emoji. Uh, and we will also hopefully get that link added to the description of this video. Um, so you can click on it there or else we will definitely be tweeting it from our own uh, Twitter account so people can, can get those links uh, and you can follow uh, for you know the the full <laughs> the full cited citable version of the uh, papers you can check uh, because internet and the references cited therein uh, and then also our paper for uh, language at internet the journal which is uh, open access and freely available online if you want to see the detailed version of that. Lauren, anything to say? Um, just thank you so much to Abrilin for setting up this amazing just months of uh, wonderful talks by amazing linguists and for letting us also participate in, in that. It's been a really great experience. So I want to thank you in the name of, or on behalf of 
Abralin for sharing, you know, such amazing and really interesting uh, and intriguing, you know, research, research, because even for me, it was really, you know, really new. So once again, thank you, Lauren and Gretchen for sharing your, your knowledge on internet, internet linguistics. So thank you once again. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>